Christ is risen. He is risen. Before I begin and forget, let me greet all mothers on Mother's Day and wish them a happy Mother's Day. I don't know about you, but I am very tired of death. With the COVID-19 pandemic, it's taken a toll on all of us. I don't think there's anyone that couldn't name someone, maybe someone close to them that's been taken in this last year. I buried my father on Thursday. Today is his 88th birthday. He was a faithful man, full of love. And if there's anything that unites us as human beings, it's death. We all share that in common, doesn't matter, race, gender, age, marital status, religion, ethnicity. We all have to deal with the problem of death. It's at the very heart of the matter of being a human being. And we can only imagine what was on Thomas's mind when he was missing the day that Jesus appeared to the other ten disciples. Perhaps... He was grieving and confused. The church, in fact, doesn't criticize him for his doubt. In our hymns that we sang last night and a little bit today, we refer to it as blessed doubt, because Thomas was actually searching, genuinely seeking answers about Jesus' death and resurrection, and it led him to faith. Like the rest of us, Thomas was grappling with the problem of death. Now, we're surrounded in our culture with many secular ideas and approaches to the topic of death, but it's sort of an off-limits, taboo subject like God or religion, things that you wouldn't talk about in polite conversation. But it's truly the elephant in every room. Most people, I think, simply try to ignore it. They go about living their best life however they might define that. At a eulogy, I often hear things like, so-and-so was a really great (coughs) businessman who loved to golf. Maybe at the end of the service, they'll even slip a golf club into the casket at the end. Or so-and-so was a great athlete. She really was when she was younger. Or so-and-so was an award-winning physician and scientist. He made many discoveries that helped people throughout his career. And at the end, families and friends will say that he or she lived life to the fullest, all defined by their earthly success and their earthly pleasures. Thomas might have been stunned, thinking that Jesus, who he and the disciples all thought was the Messiah, he appeared to be a complete failure politically and religiously. He was executed as a criminal. He was hanged on a tree, which is a curse under Jewish law. Their movement had gone terribly, terribly wrong. Wasn't Jesus supposed to be some kind of a great king? And wasn't he, Thomas, with the other disciples, supposed to have a very important part in the ushering in of this kingdom. Perhaps Thomas, like those with a secular view of death, thought that the end was simply annihilation. And surely it looked like that very early on that first Easter Sunday. The women, too, remember them. They went to the tomb carrying spices. They thought they were going to anoint a corpse that was decaying in the tomb. They were shocked to find the tomb empty and learned that death itself had been annihilated rather than Jesus. Thomas' uh, doubt turned to faith when he met the risen Lord personally later in the day, just like Mary Magdalene in the garden. After meeting the risen Lord and seeing that death was not the end, Thomas proclaimed, My Lord and my God. And this is the only place in all of the Gospels where Jesus is referred to as God. Theos. In the light of the resurrection, everything, everything is seen differently. His entire worldview was changed. 
And if death isn't the end, the implications are profound. And it literally is unbounded. That elephant in the room has been dealt with decisively, definitely. This is an aha moment. You know what I mean by that? I remember the day that somebody explained to me that uh, Arby's, the restaurant chain, isn't named after somebody named Arby. R B, roast beef, their signature sandwich. Who knew? <laughs> or the day that my daughter realized that raisins were just dried grapes. Christianity was born from this aha moment. The message of the earliest Christians wasn't that Jesus had fantastic teachings. It was the empty tomb. Jesus was raised from the dead. He was alive. If you look at those earliest sermons in the book of Acts, you'll see that the contents of the apostles' teaching was the empty tomb, not Jesus' teachings. And they were so convinced of this fact that they were willing to die for that belief. And if death has been put to death, if the great elephant in the room has actually been slain, that's good news indeed. Like any significant aha moment, Arby's and Raisins aside, there are profound implications that such a realization has that reach forward to how we'll live in the future and also to how we'll look back on history before us. Yaroslav Pelikan, the great church historian, he was a late convert to orthodoxy, and he was the Sterling Professor of History at Yale when I was there as a seminarian, famously said, if Christ has risen from the dead, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen from the dead, nothing else matters. I'll say it again. If Christ is risen from the dead, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen from the dead, nothing else matters. Because if Christ is not risen from the dead, then death is just annihilation. The secular view is in fact correct, and our life is just an absurdity. It's pointless. As one of my cynical high school friends used to say, you work hard all your life, and then you die. St. Paul says that if Christ is not raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. We're still in our sins, and we of all people are to be most pitied. But if Christ is risen from the dead, and death has been put to death, it changes everything about how we view history, and about how we are to live. How people relate to God and to death really defines their entire life. We will behave according to what we believe about these things, God and death. Letter to the Hebrews says that the root cause of all our sinfulness is our underlying fear of death. Thomas, in his aha moment, recognized Jesus as God himself. Since God alone has the power over life and death, Thomas realized in that moment that Jesus' kingdom, of which he spoke, was not some earthly improvement in the plight of ethnic Jews in Palestine under Roman oppression. Oh no, the enemy that Jesus was out to destroy was on a much grander scale, death itself. In St. John's Gospel, the climactic scene is the raising of Lazarus. Jesus, because of his love for Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, he's grieved to the point of tears at his death. And Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. This is one of those I am statements. I am the resurrection and the life. And I am, of course, is the divine name, ego in me. And Jesus, Jesus refers to himself frequently with this name, especially in the Gospel of John, a name that's reserved for God alone. Jesus asks Martha, do you believe this? She says to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is to come into the world. And those are the same words that are the confession of faith that Peter speaks in the other Gospels. Jesus congratulates Peter and says that on the rock of this confession of faith, on these words, 
is built the entire church, the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that confession is made by Martha, by Thomas, and by us in the context of the resurrection, his and ours. We unite ourselves to Jesus' death and resurrection in our baptism. Jesus says, he who believes in me will never die. St. Paisius puts it this way, we never really die, we just pass from life to life. Those aha moments are the ones that change our lives dramatically, bringing new and clear perspective. St. Luke records the story of Jesus' appearance to Luke and Cleopas on the day of the resurrection while walking on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize Jesus for who he was until Jesus explained to them, walking on the way, that all of the Old Testament scriptures, the law, the Psalms, the prophets, all of these things were really about him. And only in the glow of the resurrection did they have sufficient light to be able to see the sweeping plan of God for the salvation of the world. And when they had their aha moment, when they recognized the risen Jesus in the breaking of the bread that night at dinner, they said their hearts burned within them as he opened to us the scriptures. At the Old Testament readings during the pre-sanctified liturgies, you'll remember that while we're kneeling, the priest comes out holding a candle and says, it's the light of Christ that illumines all. The Old Testament, with all of its stories of bloody conquest, that's really about God slaying our enemies. And the greatest of those is death itself. The Promised Land, that's not about some piece of property in the Middle East. It's about eternal life in paradise, the heavenly Jerusalem. You see, all of the scriptures is a love story. God loves us as a parent loves a child, as a bridegroom loves a bride, to the point of sacrificing his life to give life. You know, the Gospels, if you total up the pages, more than half of those pages are narrative of the Passion. One of my seminary professors described one of the Gospels as a Passion narrative with an introduction. It's inescapable that Jesus is revealed most clearly to be God in that he suffers. It's at his crucifixion that he's revealed to be God, lifted up as the King of Glory. And anyone who really loves will suffer for it. Those tears that we cry when we lose someone, that's the price we pay for how much we love. And it's worth it. That God's love is stronger than death, that his mercy endures forever. That is the good news of the gospel, and that changes everything. Everything is fulfilled in Christ and brought to a conclusion. It is finished, completed, done. We have already been buried and raised with Christ. We have already and are already today eating the bread of the kingdom of God while we're still in this world. We're already risen and belong to paradise. But we're still in this world suffering because it is the end of the age and we're bearing witness, martyria to the world of what Christ has done. But we cannot die because if you believe in me, even if you die, yet you shall live. We will continue to bear witness until he comes again for us, either at our own death or in his glorious second coming. And we must each examine our own lives in this light of the resurrection, like Thomas, and be jolted out of our secular worldview. Because if Christ is raised from the dead, nothing else matters. What have we lived for? What is worth living for going forward? What is worth dying for? What aha is the Lord trying to make burn in our hearts? in the light of the fact that we will never die. Let us join with the psalmist and say, I will not die but live, and declare the works of the Lord. Christ is risen. Indeed.